things. We also have information from the Lost Pages that says that uh, from a couple people saying, tracing back to Joseph Smith, saying that Laban was of the tribe of Ephraim. Well, the birthright son of Joseph was Ephraim, so mm-hmm. this would fit, right? Mm-hmm. Joshua, we're told in the Bible, was of the tribe of Ephraim. So all the data points that mm-hmm. he's saying here, they all actually line up perfectly. They fit perfectly. And so we know that the brass plates have first person record of Joseph that's mm. not in our Bible that comes from the tribe of Judah. Yeah. What would explain all these distinctive features of the brass plates? There's one thing that would explain all of them. This oh. is the sword that his descendant Joshua is going to carry to lead the conquest of the promised oh. land. It was caused to be made by Joseph of old in Egypt by the direction of God. Everything there fits, and there's a lot more that fits. And was in the hand of Joshua when he led the house of Israel. Now why would Joseph have had this sword made? What would this have looked like? This is the sword of the conquest. He is the new Joshua. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I'm your host, Cardin Ellis, and today I'm joined in the studio by Brad Whitbeck, as well as Don Bradley, author of The Lost 116 Pages. If you guys haven't had a chance to buy this book, it is the biggest book in the past decade, and I have been devouring it, and we've invited Don Bradley to come on to the uh, show today to talk about a, a, a finding that blew my mind. Don. In this book, you bring to light the supreme possibility, if that's a way of describing it, that the sword of Laban, that well-known, dare I say, beloved, influential, powerful, intriguing, interesting, captivating artifact, wasn't just the sword of Laban, but probably the sword of Joshua used in the wars against the Canaanites in the book of Genesis that was preserved through uh, basically the paternal lineage of the kings all the way down until Laban. And that indeed, when Joseph Smith discovered the golden plates with the sword of Laban, he'd actually had a sword that accompanied Mos- uh, sorry, uh, Joshua through all the wars, made it back to Jerusalem, Laban had it, and then ultimately ended up with Moroni um, at all. I, it blew my mind that basically in a nutshell, the sword of Laban is the sword of Joshua. Where do I go wrong? How did I botch this? Start the sentence with, well, actually, no, I just can't. Well, actually. No, <laughs> well, it helps if I have your microphone on too. I'm an idiot. There, <laughs> there, there's your microphone right there, bro. <laughs> okay. Keep going. There, there's the trick, right? I, I, give the critique of what you said, but you only let me do that when my microphone is off. So yeah, for hears real. It. There exactly. We go. Uh, well, actually, Cardin, uh, that was pretty good. Oh, it was? Hey. Yeah. So, okay, for this and more, check us out at wardradio.com. <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm writing Dawn's next book. No, okay. So, um, yes, there is direct evidence. There's an account that tells us that the sword of Laban had previously been possessed by Joshua. It was the biblical sword of Joshua used in the book of Joshua. And that prior to that, it had actually been forged by Joseph in Egypt. Wait, seriously? Mm-hmm. Dude. So, so we have an account that says this, right? And this is one of our evidences for what was in the last 116 pages. Oh. But in order to understand the background for it and why that account is credible, Right? Why should we believe this? Yeah. We would want to look and see what other information do we have that about the descent of the relics in Laban's possession. Right. So remember, he's got a sword. He's also got the brass plates. Right? Yeah. Mm. And so um, in, in, in my book, um, like when I am attempting to reconstruct what we can of the missing narrative of the Book of Mormon, the lost pages, I use a combination of different kinds of clues and sources. So I use internal evidence in the Book of Mormon text and then external evidence sources outside. And both of those point to the relics possessed by Laban having a deep history that goes all the way back to Joseph in Egypt. Hmm. Right, so these are 
Egyptian relics that go back to the book of Genesis, the Genesis patriarchs, right, and are handed down. And there are several things indicating this. So we have, like I said, evidence in the Book of Mormon text that we have now still, and then we have accounts outside of that text. So for um, the, we got the sort of Laban, we got the brass plates. How did Laban get the brass plates, and what were these brass plates? Well, the Book of Mormon text we have gives us a number of clues, right? It tells us different things about these plates. So obviously it tells us they're made of brass, right? Uh, but other than that, all the things that it tells us actually connect those plates to Joseph of Egypt, right? So think about this, okay? So in um, 1 Nephi 5, uh, it says that they were kept um, by a line descending from Joseph of Egypt. It says Laban kept this record and his fathers kept this record because they were descendants of Joseph of Egypt. Mm -hmm. So it's connecting the record to Joseph of Egypt, right? Yeah. So, so why would it be the case that because they were men descended from Joseph of Egypt, they would keep the record unless the record itself had something very directly to do with Joseph of Egypt and his family, right? Mm. And so that is a good supposition. Yeah, yes. I try and use big words when you're around, Don. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I get calls up. Keep going. Nephi good, chapter I, I'll, five. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a pat on the head later, Cardin. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, no problem. No problem. Hey, by the way, before you go mm -hmm. any further, just because your hair is so well lit right now with the backlighting, mm -hmm. I have to give props to one of the people in our live stream recently said Don Bradley invented the Gen Z bro haircut <laughs> before Gen Z bro haircuts were Gen Z bro haircuts. <laughs> and look, dog. I mean, it's looking it's looking voluminous and grand at this point. My question, my only question is before we do this obvious, important deep dive mm. into whether or not the sword of Laban was the sword of Joshua, I have to know with how great it is on top. Did you or did you not ever have a mullet in the mid 80s to the early 90s? Be honest, Don Bradley. Uh, I've never had a mullet. Because no. your mullet okay, would we can be trust amazing. Him. We can trust him. Because okay, I, I, I had I had Jesus hair. I had what my brother called Latin lover hair. Ooh, but I never wow. had a mullet. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you ever want to just venture outside of the Gen Z bro haircut, I think with the kind of cool business you got going on there with some long straightened mullet in back, you might be the coolest historian to ever never rock. do it. A Don. Harley <laughs> Davidson. Never do and it. A temple recommend. Our All worst right. president <laughs> in history had a mullet, and it was horrible. Oh, Bill Clinton had a mullet? No, James K. Polk, man. <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. I, didn't, I didn't realize that. All right. So, Don, we veer verbose. All right. We're talking modern day labor. So, so I do of, have to say that yeah. so I, I tend to be ahead of the curve, right? So, yes, I had the I had the Gen Z bro hair before it was Gen Z bro hair. I also, I had a faith crisis before it was cool. That's oh. true, like Tom. way before it was cool. Before this was like the in thing, I did. I did the whole. You were doing 2015 thing, yeah. and like 2008, man. I was doing it before that. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Oh, we'll dang. keep going. Oh, yeah. Tell us uh, how we'll be morally justified in slaughtering uh, <laughs> the the heads of our opponents with <laughs> angelically manifested uh, just, relics just, from just, the past. Just to connect these these topics that seem like they're not the same thing, I do have to confess that I have my hair cut by a woman who uses the sort of Laban to cut yeah. it. It's still, it's still very sharp. You just, right? Damascus steel mm -hmm. is yeah. real. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going, yes. bro. So um, the brass plates were handed down among descendants of Joseph, right? They contain, we're told in First Nephi, the genealogy of Joseph, mm -hmm. right? In fact... Um, they contain a detailed genealogy, so detailed that Lehi can locate himself in the genealogy there, although he lives 11 centuries after Joseph. Really? So, so, uh -huh. so there's an extensive genealogy of Joseph's family. Why does this record have such an extensive genealogy of Joseph's family? Because it's a record of Joseph's family. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, then um, it transmits, we're told, a record of uh, prophets who were descended from Joseph. So we know Zenus and Zenic, yeah. right? Where they're yes. quoted in our Book of Mormon text, they're quoted from the brass plates. You mean the lost teacher of righteousness? Uh, yeah, we can go into that later. Okay. Yes, maybe. Uh, <laughs> okay, so Zenus and Zenic. So in 3rd Nephi 10, it actually says that the um, 
Lamanite, that the Nephites and Lamanites are descendants of Zenus and Zenic. Well, how can they be descendants of Zenus and Zenic? Zenus mm -hmm. and Zenic were brass plates prophets, not Book of Mormon people. Mm -hmm. Well, they would have to be part of the. They would the have to be part of the line of Joseph because the Book of Mormon peoples are part of the line of Joseph. So Zenus and Zenic are apparently Josephite prophets, and they're in the Judahite Bible that we have. That we have, they're not in that Bible, mm -hmm. but in the brass plates Josephite Bible, they're there. And they are Josephites, and so this is another thing that connects the brass plates. Are the brass plates are distinctively connected to the tribes of Joseph, the family of Joseph of Egypt? Okay. Wow. Then we have the fact that so, so I'm just looking at like what do we know? What are we told about the brass plates, and how are the brass plates different from our Bible? One other way is they have like in Second Nephi three, they have the first person prophecies of Joseph of Egypt. Mm. Right, he's prophesying. Moses, he prophesies Aaron, he prophesies the biblical exodus, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, where the children of Israel are going back, they're retaking their promised land. And he, you have like <laughs> Captain Moroni quoting further Joseph prophecies. Joseph prophecies, right, in Alma from the brass plates. Mm -hmm. And so we know that the brass plates have first person record of Joseph that's hmm. not in our Bible that comes from the tribe of Judah. Why does it have first-person prophecies of Joseph. Well, who would have recorded Joseph's own first-person prophecies? Well, Immediate family uh, let, me, let, me, let me guess, maybe like somebody like maybe Joseph? Yeah. You know, like, so, or, or his immediate family, right? Dude. Well, given that this is handed down by his descendants. Yeah. So is this, does this give credence to Jonah Barnes' supposition that Lehi had to have been using an apocryphal Bible or an apocryphal Genesis, like a different <laughs> Genesis than the one that we have right now? Yeah. So there is indication in the Book of Mormon text that the biblical text that's on the brass plates is different from the biblical text that we have. And it would be apparently this Josephite, it's Josephite instead of Josephite version. Judahite, right? is that the correct yeah. term? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, so notice that everything that we've spelled out so far about the brass plates and how they're distinctive from the different from the Bible, it's like, well, they're handed down to the, by the descendants of Joseph. They have the genealogy of the family of Joseph. They have these other prophets like Zenus and Zenic who are descendants of Joseph. They have the first person prophecies of Joseph. Do you notice a theme? Like <laughs> everything that's different about the brass plates version of the Bible has to do with Joseph. Except one thing, which is it tells us they're written in Egyptian. What well, actually does have to do with Joseph of Because Egypt, he would have spoke right? Egyptian. Because so he's in Egypt. Been. This was a fascinating thing that uh, when Cardin and I were out in uh, Israel, in Saudi Arabia, we were yeah. traveling with a guy who was talking to us about this and said... Um, Don't lie to them, Brad. It was our honeymoon. <laughs> Don't you lie. Why are you where, afraid? Where did that come from? <laughs> Just, why do you hide us? <laughs> oh my gosh. So um, what this guy was saying was that um, when the scriptures talk about Moses yeah. and how he was slow of speech, it wasn't like this guy had a speech impediment. It was that he grew up speaking oh. Egyptian. Oh, and so he was slow of speech in that he didn't speak Hebrew. And this was and a so, Muslim that figured this out. He literally no, said, I don't know why you Mormons, because he was very familiar with Mormons, any uh, the selling of antiquities, the uh, statues, the Book of Mormon narratives, things like that. And he says, I've heard people say Moses was slow of speech because they thought he had a speech impediment, like he stuttered. No, he was an Egyptian that was told to let all of the tell Pharaoh to let the, the Semitic people go. And he's like, that's why he wasn't giving Caleb his brother. And he was given Aaron as a mouthpiece because Aaron was from the tribe of, of Joseph and most likely spoke Egyptian. So he's the only guy that he could communicate with because Moses raised from a baby when he was taken by Pharaoh's wife out of the Nile only knew one language, most likely mm. Egyptian. Interesting. And this is yeah. why you see like Joshua becoming an important figure with Moses is because he was of the tribe of Ephraim, which would have spoken more Egyptian mm -hmm. is what this guy was saying. Right. Yeah. And so you see some of this like Egyptian influence from Joseph of Egypt passed down to his descendants. Yeah. And so I, I think that's a really fascinating thing to possibly tie in with what you're saying here. Yeah. Also, yeah. he took out different types of like Roman rings, uh, ancient Egyptian rings, Jewish rings, Semitic rings, canine rings, everything. And he said, 
I think there was far more intercourse in between these civilizations than people realize because, for example, look at these rings and look at these seals. Some of them had scarabs on them with Hebrew writing. And he's like, you know, scarabs were heavily symbolic in, in ancient Egypt. Also, the ancient bull. Yes, that could have meant Baal, but it also could have meant this and that. And he's like, mm. there's so much more intercourse in all of the ancient symbology on some of these seals and these rings mm. that even people realize uh, that it seems almost unlikely to me that there wasn't a subset of people that didn't speak reformed Egyptian. Yeah. So in, in the Bible, um, I had looked this up while I was writing uh, and I can't remember the exact passage, but there are biblical passages that show Joseph. I mean, obviously he's raised in, you know, the a Hebrew family, mm -hmm. uh, but he is clearly fluent in Egyptian and he is like the vice ruler, like the vice pharaoh of Egypt. So uh -huh. you would think he would be. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the fact that these brass plates are written in Egyptian is a connection with Joseph, Joseph of Egypt. Of Egypt. So, so if yeah. we're trying to build a, a model, mental model for understanding these brass plates, well, yeah. what would explain all these distinctive features of the brass plates? There's one thing that would explain all of them. If they're started by Joseph in Egypt, mm -hmm. that explains why they're written in Egyptian. Mm -hmm. It explains why they're handed down to his descendants. It explains why they have the genealogy of his family. It explains why they have his first person prophecies because he wrote them there. Yeah. Right. And it explains why it's got the prophecies of these other Josephite prophets because he hands them down and then his descendants who are prophets write in them and pass them along. Right? So, yeah. besides determining that the sort of Laban was the sort of Joshua, the same mental rubric basically determines that the brass plates were originally written by Joseph of Egypt. Right. So once and once we see from the internal evidence in the Book of Mormon text that we have that, you know, the brass plates appear to have been originated by Joseph in Egypt, that would explain all their distinctive features. Mm -hmm. Then it makes all the more sense to look, okay, well, this relic that's passed along with them where Laban has the sword, ah. what's its origin? Well, if he's got brass plates that are handed down all the way from Joseph in Egypt, what about the sword? Yeah. And then it so happens that a close associate of Martin, so remember Martin Harris is the guy who scribes for almost all this manuscript. He's the guy who borrows the manuscript, is reading it, takes it home, is reading it to people. He's the guy who's going to have the greatest familiarity with this manuscript before it's lost. He has a close associate in Kirtland for decades. Martin never goes, well, he doesn't go west till like 1870 or something. All that time, he stays in Kirtland. He's got this neighbor there, Francis Gladden Bishop. Gladden Bishop milks Martin Harris for information, and he says this, okay? And I have to admit, I am plagiarizing this from a book. However, it's my own book, so yeah. I feel totally good about it. Um, so, um, so Gladden Bishop published this in the early 1850s, um, in Kirtland based on this information from Martin Harris. He says, of the sword of Laban, the history of the sword is as follows. It was caused to be made by Joseph of old in Egypt by the direction of God and was in the hand of Joshua when he led the house of Israel into the land of Canaan. And after him, it came down into the lineage of Joseph to Laban. Okay. Now, wow. all yeah. kinds of things about this fit beautifully, right? Well, Laban's already inheriting the brass plates handed down from Joseph. Whoa, it makes all the sense in the world that the sword, if you're like the birthright son of the yeah, birthright he, son he going back to Joseph. He obviously was the first born right? of a long lineage of kings. We also have information from the Lost Pages that says that uh, from a couple people saying, tracing back to Joseph Smith, saying that Laban was of the tribe of Ephraim. Well, the birthright son of Joseph was Ephraim, so mm. this would fit, right? Mm -hmm. Joshua, we're told in the Bible, was of the tribe of Ephraim. So all the data points that mm -hmm. he's saying here, they all actually line up perfectly. They fit perfectly, right? So apparently these two relics, the book and the sword, which by the way, in ancient times and even more recent times, like uh, certain regal relics tend to be handed down in families, like a sword, yeah. a book, often an, an orb, kind of like the Liahona, right? Like This is the get, rapier like, that my great-great-great-grandfather <laughs> took into the Civil War at Gettysburg. I've seen stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, these twin relics apparently are handed down in the lineage of Joseph down to, Joshua, down to his son Ephraim down through Joshua, and then down to Laban eventually. Laban, remember, Nephi describes him as a military man. He 
He can command 50, he can slay 50. Joshua was the commander of the armies. It's apparently like a military lineage mm. that he comes through. Okay? okay. So everything there fits. And there's a lot more that fits. Think about this, okay? So um, the um, when he says that Joseph caused this sword to be made in Egypt and then it's used for the conquest. Now, why would Joseph have had this sword made? Remember, Joseph in the Bible, in Genesis, is prophesying, someday you will return to our promised land, take my bones with you, carry my bones with you, which they do. They mm -hmm. fulfill that promise that they make to Joseph on his deathbed. In the Book of Mormon and in the JST, it also tells us that Joseph prophesied in detail about the Exodus, not just in general terms like he does in Genesis. He prophesied that Moses would lead the Exodus. He prophesies Aaron. Right? As part of the Exodus, he prophesies the retaking of the promised land, which we call the conquest. Now, if he's seeing as a seer, he's seeing the future, he's predicting the descendants of Levi who will be involved in the Exodus, Moses and Aaron, he's not going to see his own descendant, Joshua, who is a big part of the Exodus and leads the conquest. Of course, he's going to see that. right? Mm. And so, because he foresees the need to retake the promised land, he has a sword forged for that purpose. This oh. is the sword that his descendant Joshua is going to carry to lead the conquest of the wow. promised land. Okay? Dude. Right? <laughs> I love it. That's so cool. So, what would this have looked like? What, what kind of a sword would this have been? So there is a description that Gladden Bishop gives that I'm more skeptical of. He claims that he like sees it himself in vision. I'm mm. sure he's getting some of his information from Martin. I, I could try to find it, but I don't have it in front of me right now. It's all right, good. It's all good. We trust your He brain. does say that like, he says that the sword has a guard, which when I looked that up, it sounded like Guards were not like invented three until relatively late, 1700s, but like, I don't know, yeah. right? Like, but uh, he does give description. He's, it sounds very ornate from Gladden Bishop's description. If his description is part, is it all right? Which it may be, mm -hmm. at least in part, because he's getting some information from Martin, right? Mm -hmm. um, but think about how this sword, it goes from Laban to Nephi, right? Mm -hmm. So here we sort of switch biblical stories from Joshua and the conquest for a minute to uh, David and Goliath. Yeah. Right. So Goliath, David, before he becomes king of Judah or king of Israel, he uh, fights Goliath. He cuts off Goliath's head with his own sword. Mm -hmm. That whole narrative of David and Goliath, um, there's a scholar, Ben McGuire, who has pointed out that there are like a dozen elements of that story that are repeated in the same order in the story of Nephi and Laban. Hmm. And Nephi is like the new David starting a new dynasty, fights the new Goliath, cuts his head off with his own sword. Right? So Nephi becomes the possessor of that sword. Well, whose sword was this originally? Joseph of Egypt. Oh, you mean like the Joseph who's like the younger brother who rules over his older brothers yeah. who resent it? Ah, uh, like Laman Lemuel. Just like right? Nephi, yeah. Nephi is the new Joseph, but Nephi is also the new Joshua, okay? He comes into a new promised land and he is like leading the conquest. Now there's not actually a conquest in the same sense as there is in the Bible, right? The Jaredites have already wiped themselves out and they fight against the, the Lamanites defensively. He says he wields the sword of Laban in defense of his people. This is the sword of the conquest. He is the new Joshua, okay? Now this sword gets, uh, according to some accounts, like Joseph Smith Sr. I talk about in the book, um, gives an account to a local guy, Fayette Latham, where he says that the sword was in the box, but all that was left was the hilt, that the blade had cankered and rusted away. I see symbolic significance in this, okay? So the Book of Mormon talks about how the word is mightier than the sword, the word of God hmm. is mightier than the sword. It talks about this in Alma. The word, we're told in Alma, it's predicted the plates, plates of brass that contain the word of God will never be doomed, but the sword rusts away. Hey, the word ah, of God stands okay, forever. Wow. It's more powerful, but the sword rusts away. Ultimately, the power is not in the sword. It's in the word. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So if I got this straight, because unfortunately we got a hard out coming out here. Um, basically, Joseph of Egypt foresaw not only the descendants of, of the Jewish nation, but specifically his own. Therefore, he had forged in Egypt, most likely the sword of Joshua in preparation for that conquest. Yeah. And that that sword stayed in the Josephite lineage 
uh, all the way down until basically 600 BC when Lehi leaves Jerusalem. Along with the brass plates. Along right? with the brass plates and all these other, what would have been ostensibly Josephite relics mm -hmm. were maintained throughout that dynasty. And that that is the, the sword that ended up showing up with Joseph Smith and the gold plates. And though it was rusted, the plates weren't showing that the word of Joseph had actually lasted longer than the sword thereof. Is that yes. a correct soundbite? Yeah. Dude, that is awesome. Okay, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have right now here on the radio. We're going to keep the conversation going online. If you want to check us out, you can go to hometownstation.com and see some of our podcasts, our radio programs, and our YouTube videos there. Or you can check us out on YouTube at Ward Radio, or you can go straight to wardradio.com. Either way, we're going to keep the conversation going there. This is totally awesome. I can't wait to hear what else you have to say about the Sword of Joshua. Thanks, everybody, for listening. This is FM 98.1 and AM 1220. KHTS. We'll be back in a minute. I ain't trying to bring you down, but for real, you might as well give up now. Think you got a chance, but I don't see how. Got a real tight grip when I hold that crown. My life been good and bad and all around. The more things I lost, the more I found. One thing I taught myself to do, no matter the problem, refuse to lose. So, hey guys. Thanks for watching the video. Before you go, I want to put a little bit of a plug in here for my buddy Don Bradley. He's written a book called The Lost 116 Pages. We've talked a lot about it on this show, and you know what? There's plenty of material. We're going to talk more. He's coming back into the studio pretty soon, and we want everybody to be familiar with his book because we're going to talk about a lot of what is inside. So before he comes back and we have this kind of ask me anything about this book, we're going to do a little bit of a book club and have you guys all go buy it all read it as much as you can over the next two or three weeks so that when he's in here and we do this little ask me anything, you guys will have all kinds of questions you can ask him. Now, he's not the best self promoter out there, but his book is the best book. It is the seminal work of Mormon history in the past decade and you have to get it. So make sure you guys go buy Don Bradley's book, The Lost 116 Pages, so we can talk about it when he's back in the studio. Other than that, please make sure you like this video. Please make sure you share this video and you subscribe subscribe to this channel. For this and more, please make sure you check us out at wardradio.com.